Okay. So, uh, so hi, and uh, thanks everyone for attending uh, this event today. So today we are very happy to organize two events of the SCORE PSC Chair on Macroeconomic Risk. Ah, so we'll start with the annual lecture uh, of the chair, and then later on at 5.30 we'll have the talk for the Junior Research Prize. Uh, I'm going to also use this time to say that uh, despite the COVID situation, the activities of the chair do continue. And in particular, we have just released the last newsletter of the chair. So it's on our we website if you're interested. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, Professor Gilles Saint-Paul uh, introduce the speaker of the lecture. But before that, a quick recap of the rules. So uh, all participants should be on, uh, muted by default, but you can all ask questions uh, during the talk. It's going to work like a regular macro seminar. So of course, if you want to ask a question, you'll have to unmute yourself, your mic, and then after you're done, please mute your mic again, otherwise the sound becomes really bad. And we will also take more questions at the end of the talk. Uh, last is that we are recording this, uh, this lecture. So if you ask a question and activate your video, you will be recorded, just for you to let you know. Uh, all right, thank you. Good. OK, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Jesus, who gives uh, this year's annual SCORE lecture. Uh, Jesus is uh, one of the most prominent uh, representatives of what we call the Minnesota School of macroeconomics, uh, some people call it the Spanish school. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, he has uh, contributed to uh, uh, many uh, topics. And uh, his work is particularly relevant for the uh, general topic of this uh, SCORE PSC chair. In particular, he has a number of papers on rare disasters, which is, of course, you know, uh, a big uh, element of macroeconomic risk. Um, uh, he has worked also on cryptocurrency. Uh, today is going to talk about artificial intelligence, which is probably one of the most uh, important uh, long-term issues in macroeconomics. And he did not waste his time because he's part of the people who have proposed uh, evaluations and solutions for the COVID crisis. So this is a pre-announcement that next week in the context of, of the chair, we will have a round table on May 4 with Jesus, uh, two uh, visitors of PSC um, associated with the chair, Ben Moll and uh, Facundo Piguillem, and uh, pending confirmation, the CEO of uh, SCORE, Denis Kessler, will also participate. So it will be very interesting to have the viewpoint of reinsurers about, about the crisis. Okay. But for today, we just, you know, put the stress aside, uh, forget being scared about viruses. Let's just be scared about robots. <laughs> and the floor is yours, uh, Jesus. Thanks for accepting to come. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me here. And uh, let me be sure. Um, okay. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, you hear me well without any problem, I hope. And um, today I wanted to talk about simple rules for a complex world with artificial intelligence in the interest of making this fun and being uh, a little bit less stressed about the situation. This presentation is a little bit more of a big picture presentation. I'm not going to get into a lot of nitty gritty details. Um, you can think about this as maybe the first lecture that I give in my semester on artificial intelligence and economics. And I have much more uh, technical material that I will be happy to share with anyone who is interested. I have taught a class on some of these issues recently at Stanford. And if anyone is interested in getting the slides, just send me an email and I will share all the slides uh, with you. It is hard these days to open the internet or browse a bookstore without finding an article or a book discussing artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning. I will define those concepts more carefully later on and I will provide you with some background information. Suffit to say at this moment that you can think about all these algorithms as a class of software 
that is able to tackle problems that we thought until quite recently were very difficult to tackle by computers. There is a growing literature in economics dealing with the effects of artificial intelligence and machine learning on jobs. There is a lot of concern, for instance, that automation may reduce the jobs available for those in the lower levels of a skill. There is a lot of concern about the effects of machine learning on wealth and income inequality and how it may induce even higher polarization of wealth and income in society. Some observers have even claimed that gone is the era of large armies and powerful navies that made the 20th century, and that the nations with the best algorithms, as Virgil says in the Aeneid, will rule mankind and make the world obey. And even if this case is sometimes overblown, if you are interested, there is this very nice book by Kei Fu Li, uh, Artificial Intelligence Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order that tries to elaborate on some of these ideas. One thread that increasingly appears in these works, in these articles, in these books, and which I believe is going to bound to become a much more prominent concern is the extent to which artificial intelligence can address public policy, pu public policy questions. Can we use artificial intelligence and more concretely machine learning to have better economic and public policy in general? Some proposals are mild. What do I mean by that? Well, for instance, it has been proposed, and this is an area where I have worked myself in cooperation with some central banks, that machine learning techniques may help you to detect early strains in the financial markets and thus allow regulatory agencies to respond before damage occurs, occurs. Let's imagine, for instance, that I have access to the whole universe of mortgages in France. And then I can use machine learning techniques to detect early patterns of strains in the mortgage market and then act before the situation gets out of control. For instance, machine learning has already been applied to fight electronic fraud and money laundering. We can find patterns of behavior of people moving money across different checking accounts where you are trying to evade tax payments or just trying to launder money that comes from criminal activities. And these days, you probably are aware that some of the people who believe that we can reopen the economy have been arguing that thanks to machine learning and other big data applications, we will be able to keep track of contagions and cases much better than in the past. I don't have any problem with these three applications, and they are nothing more but the natural extension of models that have been used in econometrics for decades. But there is a lot of people who are going a little bit farther than this. In particular, there is a growing number of observers and um, discussants that are talking about what they are calling digital socialism. The name comes from Morozov in 2019, but it has been proposed already in different forms by Saros in 2014 and Phillips and Rothworski. And if any of you is interested in looking at a book length treatment of this idea. This one, the People's Republic of Walmart. And you know, some of you may not be fully aware, but Walmart is this gigantic corporation in the US that has all these gigantic supermarkets. And you know, visiting Walmart is always a very interesting anthropological excursion into deep America. And basically, the argument that these uh, authors are making is Walmart sales are higher or larger than the GDP of many countries, and that if Walmart or Amazon or some of these large corporations are able to use big data and machine learning to run their business successfully, why couldn't we do the same at the national level? And in particular, they are saying that this is basically allowing us to achieve finally the promise of central planning. All that we will need is a computer or a system of computers with all the relevant information. And thanks to machine learning, although the details are often fuzzy about how to achieve that, we will get an optimal allocation of goods and services. 
And some of you at this moment may be thinking, hey, but Jesus, you surely are arguing against a straw man. Of course, there is always people like Saros and these guys making this type of comments, but is this really something that is starting to uh, affect the mainstream discussion? And I will say that these ideas are start to be uh, gathering attention from what I'm going to call quote unquote establishment figures. Let me give you an example. Jack Ma, which many of you will probably know, is the founder of Alibaba, recently made the same point in a big speech. And he was explaining how, look, I'm not going to read his whole quote, the plan economy I'm talking about is not the same as the one used by the Soviet Union or the beginning of the founding of the People's Republic of China with the help of artificial intelligence or multiple intelligence. Uh, or perception of the world will be elevated to a new level and blah, 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 allow us to finally achieve a planned economy. And on the Christmas issue of The Economist, they had a very, very long article. You know that The Economist has this special Christmas uh, issue with a lot of uh, longer articles about the future. And it had this very long article, Can Technology Plan Economies and Destroy Democracy? And in fact, was from reading this article in December, a few months ago, that I decided it would be a good idea to write down this paper and start making some points that I thought the profession at large could be interested. So no, I'm not talking about a straw man. I'm not talking about a few people out there. I'm talking about what I think is a serious policy discussion. And in fact, several of my students at Penn came to my office and asked me this question. You know, now that we have artificial intelligence, now that we have machine learning, can we finally have central planning? Can we forget about market economies? And I guess that as we go into another, and yet another economic crisis, this may become an even more relevant policy discussion. Uh, I'm going to make like a 30 seconds detour in the history of economic thought, because this is not a new argument. Uh, this argument has been made in the past, for instance, Oscar Lange in the 1950s and 1960s basically argued that central planning will work as soon as we had sufficiently good computers. Uh, I'm going to quote over here Edmond Malimbaud, he was French, he made similar arguments and Malimbaud contributed a lot to the theory of central planning in the 1960s. And some countries actually tried to do this. So for instance, in the Soviet Union, there was a group uh, guided by uh, Nikolai Fedorenko that put together something called the System for Optimal Functioning of the Economy. And Fedorenko was sufficiently uh, compelling that he convinced the Central, the, the Communist Party to build him a, a building, to create him a, a, a center called the Central Economic Mathematical Institute. And you will forgive me if I show you a photograph of that building, which is this type of uh, 1960s, early 1970s, um, brutalist style by Leonid Pavlov, who is a very famous um, Russian architect. And uh, he got a group of people working on this idea. And there was a lot of excitement in the Soviet Union and other countries on the Eastern Bloc at the time that finally, thanks to computers, you will be able to get the central planning working. And also in Chile, during the times of Salvador Allende, before the coup d'etat of 1973, Stafford Beer, who was a very famous computer scientist from the 1960s, convinced the government to create something called the Project Siversin. And this is a photograph of what was going to be literally the command center of the Chilean economy. And people will see it in this kind of very Star Trek uh, early 1970s uh, furniture, and you will see over here the screens and the feedback loops and how you know you have buttons to increase and lower production. And there is a book by Medina on the Project Siversin, which is quite fascinating to read. Okay, so the idea basically that a lot of these people is saying is, look, maybe doing this in 1973 was just not feasible. These computers were not good enough. In 1973, are going to be able to do it now. Our computers, you know, have turned a corner, maybe not now, but perhaps in two or three years, and will be finally in a situation where we can run the economy through a centralized system. And my argument is going to be perhaps not surprising since, uh, you already learned, I came from Minnesota, that no, that digital socialism may be a hipster thing to talk in Williamsburg, 
which uh, some of you may know is this kind of cool place in New York where you used to be able to go for bars and discos and cool restaurants, or in Soreditch, which I understand is the same in London, but it is a much as a chimera as analog socialism. And the reason for that is because machine learning is not going to fix the fundamental problems of central planning. And I think this is interesting because it's going to help us understand what central, what, sorry, what machine learning can and cannot do in economics. And will help us appreciate as the profession adopts machine learning, as I think it will do over the next decade in a substantial way, what we can expect from machine learning and what we cannot. And my argument is going to build around three increasingly more serious barriers to the use of machine learning in the process of central planning. The first one is that machine learning is going to require enormous data sets. And those data sets are unlikely to exist in most cases of interest. And that will help us also, as I develop this argument in more detail later, to gauge how machine learning compares with conventional and traditional econometrics. The second argument, which I think will be even stronger, is that except in a few cases, machine learning is going to suffer from an acute case of the Lucas critique. That is, machine learning is going to be extremely flexible as a way to understand the data, but it's going to be a reduced form of statistical representation. And as such, it's going, to be suff it's going to suffer from an acute case of the Lucas critique. And again, I will make this point in detail later on. And finally, what I think is the last and most powerful of my three arguments is that the allocation problem in a society is not how to solve an optimization problem given some information, but how to generate the right information when such information is dispersed and agents do not have the incentives or sometimes even the capabilities to disclosure to disclose such information to a central planner. And of course, many of you may have already recognized that I'm nothing more but restating Hayek's famous argument in his 1945 paper, which was in fact the paper cited by the Nobel uh, Committee in Sweden when he, they awarded him the prize. So I will argue all these things in more detail. And as I was mentioning before, this will help us to really understand what machine learning can and cannot do for economics as a field of research. As a consequence, what I'm going to try to counter argue is that for many centuries, we have organized our economic life around which many legal thinkers have called simple rules. What are those simple rules? Where, for instance, the private ownership of most goods, the freedom of contract, when we engage into contractual relations that are basically decided based on our preferences and interests, and we have a set of uniform and impersonal norms, where we are not trying to give a, personal, a personalized norm, but where you come up with some type of general ex ante rule about how you are going to deal with different people. Of course, these simple rules are subject to many caveats and limitations. We don't allow any type of contracts. There is no, it is not allowed by the legal system for me, for example, to hire someone to kill a third person, or it is not even allowed for my, uh, to um, engage in contracts that will have consequences to third people or to have consequences for the environment. But nevertheless, these simple rules that we have used for a long, long time create a market economy that allocates goods and incomes. And I'm going to try to argue that even in a world where you have widespread machine learning, this is going to likely to remain the best course of action. And of course, if I have time at the end, I will also try to hint at several ways in which the presence of artificial intelligence and machine learning may change how markets operate and how this may open the door to the need to thinking about new regulatory frameworks. But, and this will be, I hope, be interesting to some of you, I will argue that in fact, these simple rules have evolved over time in a related way to the ways in which a particular class of machine learning algorithms, which will be reinforcement learning, works. 
we did not come out with the idea of freedom of contracts or uniform and impersonal norms because a group of very, very smart people got together one day in a room and they say, hey, this is how we are going to organize our society. We came out with these ideas out of the process of evolutionary selection of norms that works a lot like reinforcement learning. And hopefully at the end of the talk, I will give you a little bit of an economic history overview that may complement the more abstract parts of the first half of the talk. Before I get into the uh, meat of the presentation, into the core of my argument, I want to present three caveats. One, this is a discussion where I have a skin in the game. I do machine learning for a living. As I mentioned before, I teach machine learning to graduate students. I write papers on machine learning. I go to conferences and talk about machine learning. That means that of course I believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning are enormously useful tools in many contexts and that nothing of what I'm going to say today should be interpreted in any way as implying that we should not keep our research in this area. In fact, if I may get out of the more academic part of the presentation and engage into a little bit of policy discussion, I'm quite worried as a European, a Spaniard in my case, as you can tell from my accent, that I'm quite worried that the European Union is quickly falling behind the United States and China in these fields, and that beyond a few good research groups, by and large, European Academy is not producing the level of research I would like to see. At the same time, having expressed this concern, it is crucial for us to frame the promises of artificial intelligence realistically and avoid the disappointment that could come from overpromising because neither artificial intelligence nor public policy will be well served by hyperbole or careless vows. So let me start with the focus of my presentation. Let me tell you a little bit first about what is classical artificial intelligence and how machine learning is different from classical artificial intelligence. So classical artificial intelligence started in a famed two months summer workshop at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in 1956. A group of very smart researchers got together during that summer and they spent the whole summer thinking about some of these ideas. The main people in that group were John McCarthy, this chap over here. Uh, some of you may know him. He was the guy who developed LISP which was an extraordinarily innovative programming language at that time, and is still a programming language that is influencing uh, many of the ways in which we code these days. For instance, I tell my graduate students that they should use Julia as the best programming language at this moment, and Julia has a very, very clear influence from uh, uh, John McCarthy. This is Herbert Simon, which many of you may be familiar with because he worked a lot on bounded rationality in economics. He got the Nobel Prize in economics, if I recall correctly, in 1978, maybe one or year up or down. And uh, Marvin Minsky, who was the kind of main person pushing the whole ideas of artificial intelligence until he passed away a few years ago. He had a very important lab at MIT. This classical artificial intelligence was focused on issues such as symbolic reasoning, expert systems, and cognitive model approaches. Without me entering into detail into explaining and defining carefully each of these three ideas, loosely speaking, I can tell you that those were trying to replicate, quote unquote, how human intelligence worked. We were trying to code computers into a way that will really reason about facts and the consequences of those facts in similar ways that humans will do. And in particular, we aim at code that will pass what was known as the Turing test. Some of you may have heard the Turing test. Some of you may have not. So let me show you this still from a classic movie, Blade Runner. And if you recall, this is at the beginning of the movie. This is a replicator. This is not a real human being. And this is a person, uh, a researcher that is trying to determine with this machine over here that is going to move, is going to measure his reactions, whether or not he's a machine or he's a human. 
And the idea of the Turing test was, can we design a computer that this person will not be able to tell whether it's a computer or it's a human being? And in that sense is in which classical artificial intelligence was really trying to replicate human intelligence. Of course, there was much excitement about the possibilities of computers at the time, but soon there was a sense of disappointment. And we enter into at least two winters of discontent in the 1970s and 1980s, because people got a little bit disappointed about what artificial intelligence could deliver. In fact, if you read Herbert Simon in 1965, in a very influential book called The Shape of Automation for Men and Management, and I guess that back then they will still say men and not humans, he say machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. This is 1965. We can fast forward this to 2020. So that has been, what, uh, 55 years. And that's not the case by any stretch of the imagination. There is still thousands of thousands of different an extremely simple task that humans can do and even the best computers will fail quite miserably at doing. So what happened was that over the last 10, 15 years, we approached the problem from a different perspective. In fact, uh, those, that, those ideas, that different perspective comes from a little bit earlier and I will come back to that in a second. And those new perspectives is what is known as machine learning. So what is machine learning? is a set of algorithms that detect and learn from patterns in the data and use them for decision making or for forecasting future realizations of random variables. Now, machine learning sounds very sophisticated, sounds very deep, reminds you of Terminator coming from the future and taking over humanity, but this is one of those situations where I think that both French and Spanish do much better than English at expressing the main idea. And by the way, I particularly hate when I see a Spanish media saying machine learning when you can say aprendizaje automático. And why that's the case? Because both the French and the Spanish expression capture the idea that what we are trying to do is just look at patterns on the data and we are trying to do it in a relatively automatic way. So let me give you a very simple example. I was talking before about electronic fraud. Imagine that I'm Visa, the big credit card company, and I see all the uses of credit cards in France for the last year. And I know where the credit card was used, the you know, postal code where the credit card was used, the type of shop where the credit card was used, the type of purchase, the price of the item. And I'm just going to look at patterns and I'm going to identify that under certain circumstances, some transactions are going to likely to be fraud. This is not a real credit card. This is a credit card made by some type of a criminal. And I'm not going to really try to understand why that's the case. I'm not trying to come up with any deep reason. I just realized that you know, when a credit card is used in a small village in the middle of Burgundy on a Saturday night for this amount of money, it's very likely to be a real transaction, but if the same credit card is used in Normandy on a Monday for this amount of money for buying this particular uh, item, it's going to be very likely a fraudulent transaction. And deep learning and reinforcement learning are just a subset of this more general class of algorithms, and if you want later, I can tell you exactly how uh, they separate from traditional machine learning. And the idea here is that I'm going to focus on the recursive processing of information to improve performance over time. Many of you who come from econometrics or have some experience in learning models may have already recall recursive least squares, where you have some type of agent that is learning and is getting some new information. So this is just a way to do recursive least squares in a very you know, massive way with massive amounts of information. And that's the sense in which the operational definition of learning that occurs in this type of research is not trying to aim in at passing the Turing test. Okay, We are not trying to design a Terminator that will look like a human. We are just trying to, in some very sophisticated way, uh, to forecast. So let me tell you a little bit of a detail of how this works with an interesting uh, set of observations. And in particular, this will help us to really understand what is going on. 
Imagine that what I want to do is I want to program a computer to play a two-person game. Think about checkers, uh, think about chess, or think about Go, the uh, Asian is Asian strategic game. Uh, coding checkers or chairs is actually quite easy uh, to do. In fact, uh, Chinook, which was a checkers co uh, program coded in the late 1990s, well, it was developed over several decades, has literally solved checkers. So if you are interested, this book over here, One Jump Ahead, Computer Perfection at Checkers, has proved the thing. It has, uh, this is a, a long book. The short proof was published in, in I think, either Nature Science, I think. So this is done, okay? So we know that uh, how to play checkers perfectly. And I guess that if you can play with your kid, it will be still interesting, but at the, you know, some sense of competitive level, that's done. That's not that interesting anymore. And Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov in 1996. And in some sense, that also show that solving for a programming, um, solving the, for, for, uh, for chess is not that difficult. And basically what you do in things like Chinook or Deep Blue is the following. You have a book with the openings of the game. You have a book with the closings of the game. And if any of you, you know, maybe when you were in high school, try to play chess at a little bit more of a serious level, you probably remember that those books are standard and then you have in the middle of the game basically what you do is come up with an evaluation function that maps positions of pieces in the board into payoffs and then you play max min and if you have a computer that is sufficiently good that has a very very large opening book a very very large closing book and can do max min very efficiently it will be impossible to defeat now people try to apply this to go but go is a completely different beast so this is a board of Go. It has 19 lines vertical, 19 lines horizontal, and then one player is playing with uh, black stones and the other player is playing with white stones. And you, pay, you put them together, and basically your goal is to capture surrounding other people's stones or capturing territory. The level of complication of Go is absolutely amazing. The number of legal board positions is 2 to the times 10 to the power of 170. In comparison, the number of legal positions in checkers is 5 times 10 to the power of 20. So 20 versus 170, 150 orders of magnitude more complicated. The number of legal chess positions is between 10 to the power of 43 to 10 to the power of 50. And that's why we have a still not quote unquote solved chess. You are talking about 50, 30 orders of magnitude more than checkers, but the numbers of atoms in the universe is 10 to the power of 80. So Go is 90 orders of magnitude more complex than the number of atoms in the universe. So if you stop uh, someone interested in artificial intelligence around 2012 and say, can we design a Go software that will be able to be competitive at the top level, the answer was it will take us at least a decade. And of course, this is one of those situations where you say it will take us at least a decade on the hope that a later from now, no one will remember and no one will really ask you for that software. And then 2016 came. And AlphaGo, which was a product of Google, of a section of a, of a subsidiary of Google, defeated Lee Sedol, that was perhaps the best Go player in the world at the time and one of the best Go players ever in history. And that was an absolutely shock for everyone. Here in France or in Spain, Go is not such a big deal, but in countries like South Korea or China, people actually follow big Go tournaments with the same passion that we sometimes follow soccer. So this was, in these societies, absolutely amazing. If you are interested, there is a movie called AlphaGo Movie, and I'm going to show you over there, that it doesn't get into a lot of the details, but it's a lot of fun. This is a, a, a movie you can convince your family to watch and they will not hate you. Uh, at least in the US, it's in Netflix. I don't know if it is in Netflix in, in, in France, but it will be very interesting. And also on the slides, uh, 
And you can also click over here on DeepMind, which is the subsidiary of Google I was telling you. They will tell you exactly all the details about how this thing go. I will share the slides with you later on, so you will have the hyperlinks. And the idea was that AlphaGo was very different from Chinook and DeepBlue. It was not as much about coming up with these very sophisticated ways to reason about the game. It was purely about doing some type of learning. In particular, what AlphaGo did was the following. Uh, I'm not going to bore you much with the details of how these things mean, but it's the following. I'm going to come up, I'm going to give the computer a very simple set of rules about how to behave. And I'm going to let the computer improve those rules on his own by playing with simulated against other versions of the same computer. So the, the idea is the following. So I have computer one, and computer one is going to have some rules. And those rules are going to be called a reinforcement learning policy network and a value network. But you don't need to worry much about what those rules mean. It's basically a set of rules about how to behave. And I give another computer another set of rules. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them play with each other. And if you win with your set of rules, you get reinforced. That means you are doing well. And you kind of keep those rules and maybe change them a little bit. And if you get kicked out because your rules are not winning that often, I just get rid of you and I come up with a new set of rules. Messily enough, this extremely simple way to play delivers. Can I just interrupt you, Jesus? Because I do not visualize how you could have a simple rule for Go because you know mm -hmm. the, the position is a highly dimensional state mm -hmm. variable. And it's all black dots and white dots, so there is no, you know, salient principal component that we could. Okay, so let me jump as a a sufficient yeah. statistic. Okay, so let me jump over here, and I can show you how we can do this. This is an extremely simplified way to do it, but it will make the point. I'm going to do the following. What I'm going to do is remember in the board, I'm going to have all these different places. Okay. So I have 19 by 19 places. And over here as an input, I can have plus one, which means there is a black stone. I can have a zero, which means it's empty. And I can have a minus one, which means it's a white stone. The position is occupied by a white stone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the 19 by 19 positions in a very, very large vector. And then I'm so, going so to. It's not. It's not a rule of thumb. It's not. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's not, not parsimonious. It's a neural network style black box. Exactly. That and that's can, what that we can produce because we have a lot of computer memory and the computer is fast. Exactly. I and that's it's a rule of thumb. It's the opposite of a rule of thumb. No? Yes, exactly. So maybe rule of thumb was not, uh, I, I was just saying rule, I was not saying rule of thumb, so maybe that was not very clear, but exactly. And what we are going to do is the rule is going to be the weight. And what I'm going to do is I'm look at this input, I'm going to have weights over here, I'm going to sum them, and this is going to, given the value of this, you are going to make a decision. And what the computer is going to do is going to try a lot of thetas, and by playing again and again and again and again, I'm going to search for better and better thetas. And it's going to be completely dumb in the sense that there is not going to be any way in which you are looking for better thetas because you understand something better. Now, surprisingly enough, this works really, really well in situations like playing Go. And that's why, as I was mentioning before, people got so excited about this idea. They say, how? You have these very, very simple neural networks, and yet they allow you to play, and you know, it became like the best Go player in history, the, play, the best Shogi player in history, the best chess player in history. If you want to learn a little bit more about how these things are done in real life, let me recommend you two books. One is Machine Learning by Ethem Alpaidin, and the other one is Deep Learning by John Kelleher. And that goes exactly to Jill's point that this, you can see how it's just this neural network. And what deep learning is about is that instead of having just one 
neural network like this one, what we are going to do is we are going to nest many of them. Okay, so this is exactly what we are now. And the question is, why, let me jump a little bit ahead, why these ideas, which by the way, were well known since the 1940s and the 1950s, have become so enormously prevalent right now. The first is the presence of big data. This is a graph that will give you, uh, you don't need to worry too much about the details, but this is a graph that you will see in many textbooks that highlights that the type of data size that we can deal with, the number of examples to train these networks are very easily now in the billions. So think about Netflix or think about Amazon. Netflix and Amazon gives you recommendations about which movie to watch or which book to buy. And the argument is Amazon has at this moment around 110 million households in the US that are subscribed to Amazon Prime. So these are people who systematically buy from Amazon. They know a lot about you. And you know, 110 million is 10 to the power of eight. So they really have a lot of information about you that before didn't exist. And then you can apply this very, very dumb approach and yet get very good results. The second reason why this is working a little bit better than in the past is because we have very cheap computational power that did not exist a few years ago. In particular, what we know is, of course, uh, Moore's law is that the number of transistors and hence our capability to handle information is doubling approximately every 18 months. And it has been the case since the early 1970s, even up to today. And a way to think about it is as follows. We are in April 2020. If you go back 18 months, we will be talking about the summer, July of 2018. It means that our capability to do computation has advanced as much since the summer of 2018 to today as it did from the invention of the computer until the summer of 2018. Once you think about it in that way, you realize that the amount of stuff we can do now is orders of magnitude larger than we could do even a decade ago. And finally, we have come up with a couple of very smart algorithms and a lot of these new developments came from the influence of Google. Basically, a lot of people realize, hey, these kids from Google became among the richest people on the planet because these algorithms work very well. So a lot of very smart people put their minds into thinking about new algorithms. And what I argue is that these forces are likely to become even stronger over time because we are going to have more and more data. Computers keep getting better and better. There is a lot of very, very smart people thinking about these algorithms. And in addition, now we have plenty of packages that allow the estimation of this type of problems with absolutely a standard programming languages. So a smart graduate student in economics can jump into this idea and start doing this type of uh, exercises right away. At the same time, and that's why my paper comes about, we need to be very careful. So what I have done during the last 15 minutes is telling you, hey, this it's a very powerful toolbox. It can do things like solving a, a Go, but can it really run our economy? Can we really have central planning as the economist is asking whether or not we can have? And if you recall in my introduction, I pointed out to three problems. So let me start with problem number one, which is the data problem. Machine learning requires enormous data sets that are unlikely to exist in most cases of interest. For instance, the rule of thumb in the industry is that one needs around 10 to the power of seven observations to train a complex neural network. This is not an issue if you are Walmart, if you are Amazon, or if you are Netflix, but this will be an issue when you are not one of these large corporations. In economics, sometimes we can create our own data set by simulation or experimentation, but that is not going to be the, in general the case for public policy. So imagine that I'm appointed 
at a central bank. And I say, okay, Jesus, now you are the governor of the Bank of Spain, or I'm uh, serving at the board of governors of the Federal Reserve System in the United States. Can I really use machine learning to run monetary policy? The answer is going to be most unlikely no. Why? Because in the case of the United States, I have 291 data points uh, of good quality, which is between the first quarter of 1947 and the last quarter of 19. 2019, I guess by now we have one more quarter, so 292 data points. And not often, not even, quite often, not even that. Uh, why? Well, first of all, because there are many countries for which national income and product accounts are not that good when you go before the 1980s. But even in the US, there has been so much structural change in the US economy that thinking about monetary policy using data from the 1950s is probably not that useful. And I have written many papers in econometrics that have tried to make that point. So if your question is, you know, can we substitute John Powell by a machine? The answer is no, because with 290 data points, this is never going to work. Okay, you are never going to be able to use any of these machine learning algorithms. And using micro data, yes. yeah. Sorry, but... Uh... Yeah, of course, machine learning would not work. But if yeah. monetary policy is about implementing some Taylor rule, this mm -hmm. is very simple. So we yeah, yeah. can replace some bankers by machines. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, no, no, sure, 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 sure. Right. Yeah, and no, machines. No, that... You could imagine that a, a hardwired rule in a machine has commitment uh, value that enhances the credibility of monetary policy. Of course, but that's, but that's precisely my point. This is why I'm defending simple rules. So I was defending, so the whole point of my paper is, look, what these guys are saying is, and, and this is something that you are really, and, and believe it, <laughs> I actually got into a little bit of what the British will call a honest exchange of views with a very famous computer science professor a few months ago. I was trying to defend precisely your point. No, no, the best thing you can do with monetary policy is have a very simple tailored rule and kind of run this more and more in automatic way. And this guy was saying, no, 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 no. We can have this very sophisticated machine learning algorithm that will you know, take account of absolutely everything that we see in the economy and decide very precisely what we are supposed to do in this quarter. And we'll decide in addition how to allocate credit and how to allocate investment decisions, etc." And my point was with 291 data points, you are never going to be able to do that. What you want to do is come up with a very simple rule, like the Taylor rule or something similar, and just hope for the best. And I think that the best on average is going to be quite good. So in that sense, I fully agree with you. And you know, maybe I need to, to be a little bit more careful on how I explain that. And in that sense, the problems of Walmart, Amazon, and Netflix are in some radical way much simpler than the problem of running an economy. Why? Because even Amazon, when they are trying to decide whether or not to open a depot, a distribution center, they take most prices as given. Amazon knows the price of land. Amazon knows the price of construction. Amazon knows the price of distribution. Of course, it has a little bit of market power, so it can play around a little bit with those, but Amazon understands you are not going to put a distribution center in the price in the center of Paris because the prices are too high. But if you completely get rid of a market system because you believe that machine learning can substitute those ideas, then you will need to decide what are the prices of land or in some sense, the most important question that we always face in economics, which is the trading off between the present versus the future of the implicit interest rate. And Amazon takes all this as given. So I will argue that A, Walmart, Amazon, and Netflix have access to a lot of data, which is probably not very useful for a central bank in most situations. Although, you know, as I was saying before, the central bank may use machine learning, for instance, to check out how things are working on the mortgage uh, market. But in general, they are not going to be able to use some of these machine learning algorithms to substitute the governor of the central bank. The second argument that I'm going to make is that machine learning as a reduced form a statistical procedure is subject to the Lucas critique. And the idea, of course, of the Lucas critique is that the observed behavior of agents 
come from their optimal decision under a set of rules. And if you change those rules, which is one of the goals of making a policy, agents will change their decisions. And in that sense, machine learning is really, really, really subject to this concern. And in general, it means that you cannot use machine learning to forecast the effects of many policy of interest or that your ability to do so is limited. You can do a few things and people have tried to put uh, some proposals on, on the table, but no matter how rich your information is, since machine learning is not a structural model, you are not learning about the preferences of the agents, you are not learning about the information sets, you are not learning about their technologies, the ability of a neural network to forecast what will happen under a different set of uh, policies is actually quite limited. And, but on the side, yeah. uh, couldn't you think that there could be some conditions under which you can converge? Like your algorithm learns some things and you change yes. the rules because of yes. it? Yes, yes. And that's why I was mentioned over here, there are some exceptions and people is trying to work about in this way. So for instance, some research that I have done is to use um, machine learning as a, way, as a way to summarize information from the data that can be fed into the estimation of a structural model. Yes, and the risk, is, the risk yeah. is that you converge to a situation which is a Nash equilibrium between yes. policymakers and the public, yes. which should not be the optimum, that is to say, the, the rule, uh, the policy mm -hmm. rule is optimal given the beliefs of the public and vice mm -hmm. versa. But you could improve on it by you know, internalizing yeah. the class critique. So it's yes. not obvious that you, yes. that you, you do converge, but not necessarily to an optimum. Yes, yes, and that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly my point. I fully agree with that. I, I was just saying that, you know, I don't want to make sweeping statements like this could never work. I'm just trying to say that one needs to be very careful and that my assessment at this moment is that the situations where this will work are relatively limited. At the same time, as I was mentioning before, that doesn't imply that reduced form models are not useful. We use reduced form models a lot of times with a lot of success in economics. I'm just trying to be nuanced about the type of things that we can get. And uh, the, the third argument that I, I wanted to, to mention is, of course, the Hayek's original insight that the problem of economics was never about computing an optimal solution to an allocation problem given some data. But that the problem is, and in some well-defined sense, will always be determine the preferences, abilities, and efforts of the agents in a world where everyone has an incentive to misrepresent those preferences, abilities, and effort. And machine learning can do very little to alleviate this problem. So I'm going to tell you a particular example to make this point. So yours truly, is also a little bit of a central planner. Why? Because I'm the director of gravity studies at the Department of Economics at Penn, and I face a central planning problem at the beginning of every academic year, which is I'm determining the teaching metrics. I basically, we send a request to all the faculty where we ask them, what do you want to teach? And they give us some information. And then I sit with the chair and with the director of undergraduate studies, and we come up with an allocation. And we need to determine who should teach what, who will develop new courses, and the quality or trying to come up with some guidelines of the quality of the courses that should be taught. And if I had access to one, two, and three, the computational problem of determining the optimal teaching matrix is straightforward. I could probably write a simple program that will give me the optimum in a few seconds. The problem is when I ask my colleagues, they don't have any incentives to tell me the truth. I'm not even sure I tell the truth all the time when they ask me these questions. What do I mean I don't have any incentive to tell the truth? For instance, the university may be better served if I teach an innovative large class. Gilles was mentioning that I have worked a lot on cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies. This is something I'm pretty sure a lot of undergrads will find quite interesting. However, if I teach that class, I may have 80 or 90 students. I need to do all the preparation and it will be a lot of work. However, if I teach an old class 
something that I have been teaching for years, like, you know, vector autoregressions. Well, first of all, I will not have a lot of undergrads. I will only have 10 undergrads, and I have taught vector autoregression since 2001, so I can do it on my sleep. So do I have an incentive to tell my chair I want to teach cryptocurrencies, or do I have an incentive to say I want to teach vector autoregressions? And, you know, maybe the chair can come up with some incentive system that will induce me to teach, to tell their true preferences, but that in general is going to be extremely similar. I don't have a lot of incentives to innovate in teaching because if even if I come up with a new innovative approach to lecturing, I'm probably not going to get a lot of rewards. And that to a large extent is always my model of why your teaching is roughly the same now that in the 13th century. And I don't have incentives to perform at the optimal level because I can always teach a little bit of a better class, or maybe my class is too good and I could teach it at a lower level. Why? Because the, the individual incentive, the individual rewards I get from the quality of the class that I teach, for instance, in terms of my uh, teaching evaluations, are going to be very different from the socially optimal rewards or the socially optimal uh, value of uh, teaching at the right level. And, you know, not even the students are fully aware sometimes of what is the optimal level because they will rather take an easy class that is a difficult one where they may get a little bit of a lower grade, but that will help them later on in uh, their academic career. So at the end of the day, what you have is that even a very, very simple planning problem, which is to get the 32 members of the Department of Economics at Penn to teach the right thing at the right level with the right level of innovation, fails. And this is not because we don't have the computational capabilities, it's just because we don't have ways to elicit all the information. Maybe we could come up with some mechanisms to design some of these problems, and you probably are aware that in the US or uh, 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 friends in the applied theory the par uh, groups love to come up with some of those mechanisms, but my own experience with them is that they tend to be not very robust in real life, and even if they were, they will probably be extremely difficult and cumbersome to a scale to a whole society. So in that sense, when I go back to the, econo to the economic history of the Soviet Union, I don't see that their main problem with central planning was that their computers were not powerful enough, although they were not, and that their planning algorithms were poor, although they were terrible. Is that central planning was inefficient in its very essence, in essentia sua, as the scholastic of the University of Paris will say in the 13th century. And the evidence from economic history is overwhelming. If anyone wants to read, a very short book is The Truth About Soviet Whaling, a memoir by Alfred Versin. And this is a photograph of one of the Soviet whaling ships. So we actually know now that one of the main reasons why the whale population in the planet, in the oceans of the planet, collapsed during the 1960s was Soviet whalers killed at least 180,000 more whales than they reported between 1948 and 1973. And the extremely sad thing is that they didn't even need the whales. In fact, sometimes they will just capture them, kill them, and actually toss them overboard. And why was the case? Because basically the central plan had set up quotes for whale catching and for the tons of uh, fishing that you were supposed to do. And whether or not catching these whales was useful or was not useful was absolutely irrelevant. And those are the type of incentive problems that I think that once you are, take a candid assessment of what happened in, in real life, you are going to encounter everyone. And, you know, some people have talked about Soviet whaling as the worst environmental crime of the 20th century, and I agree, because sometimes you pollute, but at least you get something out of it. The Soviets kind of got rid of a lot of whales in the Pacific, and they didn't even get anything positive out of it. So let me conclude, I know I'm already at, uh, at five o'clock, with a very, very short coda. And we didn't come up with the simple rules, like the Taylor rule, or I was mentioning before, with freedom of contracts and of private property, thanks to an enlightened legislator or to a blue ribbon committee of academics that sit down and design a plan. The simple rules that we have used in most Western countries are the product of an evolutionary process that appeared over centuries, thanks to the decisions of thousands of thousands of agents. 
Roman law, and more importantly, its rediscovery in the Middle Ages in continental Europe and Scotland. This is a photograph of a page of the Corpus Juris Civilis, which is still the base of French civil law and many other countries' European civil law. The really interesting thing about Roman law in the Middle Ages is that it was not adopted by a decision of the King of France or the King of Castile. In fact, the kings were pretty much against Roman law. What happens is the quality of law at the time was not very good. And when people rediscover Roman law in the 11th century, they realize it's a much better set of rules. And in a completely spontaneous way, they adopted those rules. The same happened with the Lex Mercatoria, which is the law that applied to merchants all across Europe and common law in England. And in that sense, you can think that good law or more in general norms that determine our society is nothing more that good applied optimal mechanism design. And what is happening is that the forces of evolution take us into the direction of coming up with very nice and simple rules. And that, in fact, is what reinforcement learning, which is one of the tools of machine learning, tell us. The reinforcement learning is about, look, don't worry too much about specifying a very detailed or complex set of rules of how to behave. Just come up with some type of rules, like the neural network I was mentioning before, and let it run in evolution. And what is going to happen is that through reasoning and experience, we are going to realize what works and what does not. And, thus, and those rules that lead to Pareto improvements tend to survive and tend to thrive. And those who did not dwindle. And that's the sense in which I think machine learning is telling us something very important about how we organize our societies. So yes, I think that we still can use machine learning for a lot of important things. Yes, it will be a great tool in economics for many problems. I have used machine learning, as I was mentioning before, to estimate the structural models. I have used machine learning to solving complex dynamic equilibrium models, but machine learning should not be a substitute of the traditional good rules that we have used over centuries. Because in fact, machine learning is telling us that the way those rules were selected over time made a lot of sense. Let me stop here. So thanks a lot uh, just for this very interesting talk. Uh, so anyone has a question, can feel free to just unmute and ask your question. Yes, maybe. Uh, can I ask a question? San, yes. Sure, of course. Sure. Of course. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, so I, I wanted to come back to the, so thanks for, for the uh, very, very clear uh, presentation. Uh, I, I wanted to come back to uh, the Lucas critique. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I understand the point, but uh, <laughs> it's true of everything. So still, you need to say things to. So imagine you have to advise the governor of the Banca mm -hmm. de España. Yeah. You still, you have to. You cannot say just say. Well, I have the Lucas critique, and I cannot say anything. Uh, so compare with the traditional um, economic methodologies, including uh, some. Uh, uh, learning uh, processes that you can estimate uh, mm -hmm. with some econometric techniques or um, rolling windows. You have a number of things mm -hmm. that th they don't eliminate the Lucas critique, but the idea is that maybe um, you cannot take old ages uh, to the same w weight on uh, old ages where you had different institutions. For instance, the monetary regime was different. Uh, so you put more weight on recent evolutions and, for instance, if you have different models that can be used by market, uh, by investors in, uh, on the market of, and they weight the different models differently over time. So it's very difficult to capture uh, with uh, traditional and econometrics, but mm -hmm. maybe with machine learning it's easier. So as uh, uh, an econometrician, so how would uh, these um, methods um, compare with uh, some advanced econometric uh, okay. uh, techniques, in yes, your no, view, vis-a-vis -vis the Lucas critique? I'm not sure I'm, I'm clear with my question. 
Okay, uh, no, no, but I, no, no, but it's, it's a very nice, it's a very nice question. So, as as I was mentioning before at the beginning of the talk, uh, I I I was not making a criticism against all applications of machine learning. I was making a criticism against the most radical proponents of applications of machine learning, and that they are telling us that thanks to machine learning they are going to fix the world. So, uh, as I was mentioning before, if I were the governor of the Banco de España, I would be very interested that, uh, for instance, my, my team of researchers are using machine learning to give me a little bit of a better indication of how the economy is. So, for instance, right now we face a very serious problem, which is we have difficult times uh, evaluating how much GDP has really gone down over the last month. And it's going to take some time for statistical agencies to have a clear view of that. So maybe machine learning can use data from electricity consumption, uh, transportation. But it sounds, it sounds, it yeah. sounds of sh sure to fail for machine learning, right? Because that's not only the look at because machine learning is about pattern recognition. Yes. So when you have a sort of totally new event like yes. the current events it's bound to fail, right? Uh, yes, yes, but perhaps... Like, okay. you know, I tried yeah. machine learning to distinguish uh, cats from dogs. I can do yes, that. Yes. And, okay, can you... If cats mutate and start looking like dogs yes. while remaining cats, yes. machine so, yeah, okay. learning is going to fail, you know, uh, tremendously. Yes. At yes, least but... it happens. No, 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 I don't know. And on, on that, but that's fair enough. So let, let me, let me, let me retract that example. Maybe that was not an example that was very good. But um, let me tell you something that I did concretely uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I'm interested in having information in real time about GDP at a higher frequency that uh, yes, the GDP that I get from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And imagine I have very, very detailed information about electricity consumption at the block level in all the blocks, like uh, city blocks in, in the US. And that information actually exists. I can have a relatively flexible model that will map that electricity consumption using this neural network into GDP. And that can be an instrument of kind of having real life uh, GDP measurement. Now, okay, so, you're absolutely so right. Would, that, uh, can I say, uh, yes. would, you, would you go uh, um, uh, saying that uh, machine learning or what is called now casting uh, yes. can be uh, very useful as uh, information tool or positive economics, but not much for normative uh, exactly. advice? Exactly, exactly. That's a very because nice For point. normative advice, you need uh, the mechanics of the model and you, you, you have no idea of yes. uh, whether, for instance, today a big uh, question is about the risk aversion. Yes. Is there a shock on the risk aversion? Yes. And, and here, machine learning will not tell you, right? Exactly. That, that's, you, you put it much better than I did. You did a much better job at explaining that I did. So yes, so machine learning will be great. And that was a little bit what I was trying to say uh, in, the, in the example before, because perhaps it was not a great example. But machine learning can help me parse through the data in a relatively efficient way. And that can be one more instrument for the governor to make a decision. But machine learning is never going to be very informative about what will be the effects of a particular fiscal stimulus program. For that, as a governor of the Bank of France or the, the governor of the Bank of Spain, I will need to have economic models that will help me to think through those issues. Huh? But are you completely sure of that? So imagine you had mm -hmm. uh, the like uh, credit card uh, yeah. data for a long period, you could estimate uh, maybe a, a model of the Keynesian multiplier with uh, this data. Yeah, but remember, the, even with that data, but then you will need to bring some type of economic theory to it. The thing is that the pure machine learning doesn't really have any, any economic theory. So if that machine learning helps me to learn about how fiscal stimulus have behaved in the past, if I start doing some new fiscal stimulus, it's going to be difficult for me to gauge, to evaluate whether or not they are going to respond in the same way now. Now, 
I'm not saying that the informational content is zero. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the other extreme, but I also will take the information from the credit card data in the past with a pinch of salt. Let me give you an example of something I have worked on. Well, not me, but one of my students work. So a lot of people have been claiming you can learn a lot from micro data uh, on consumption patterns. And they go and say, well, you know, we are really trying to evaluate the effects of fiscal stimulus using all these very, very detailed micro data, micro surveys. The problem in the US is that we have undertaken a huge change in household structure over the last 15 years. There is now much more single, many more single people now than even 20 years ago. Moreover, who is single is very different. And by single here, I don't mean you are not legally married. I, I literally mean you are living alone in a house on your own. So it used to be the case that until the early 1990s, if you did well in life and you went to college and you have a good job, chances are that by the early 30s, you were living in a long-term relation. That's not the case anymore. So your consumption pattern is now very, very different than the consumption patterns even 15 years ago. And uh, I was recently talking, well, last year, I was talking with a developer of condos in Philadelphia. And he was telling me, look, my, my business has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Why? Because it used to be the case that the only person who rented an apartment in their 40s and in their 50s were divorced men. Sorry to say that, you know? but you are in your early 40s and the people who rent apartments in my buildings were basically people who divorce, they move out of the house, the wife stays with the kids and they need a place to stay. Turns out to be the case that now I have a lot of people in their 40s, more men and women who have never worked, who have never married, never lived in a long-term relation. But they still don't want to buy a house because being single, they prefer an apartment. The type of amenities I need to offer them are very, very different. And that's why he was changing the gyms and all the common areas of the apartment building on his buildings in Philadelphia. And that's the time of sense in which having a lot of data, even at the micro level, when there are these structural changes, like changes in household behavior, are going to make you difficult to learn from stuff. Now, you have a model where you are explicit about how households are formed and how they are dissolved and why people now marry less than in the past, you may, want, you may be able to say something. If you are just going to you know, kind of have a very sophisticated machine learning that does not quite capture this, it's going to be difficult for you to use that for a policy prescription. Okay? And like everything in life, I mean, I don't want to push the argument too much. There are going to be exceptions and nuances everywhere, but that's a little bit the way I think about this. But, but isn't it the case that these changes would also not happen overnight, like a discrete shock, but um, they would happen progressively. And so if you have the data continuously, yes. uh, the algorithm will actually be flexible enough to adapt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, but that's when I go back to my point that since you are being so flexible, you need so much data. So if you are telling me, oh, Jesus, you are going to estimate a vector autoregression. Then I say, yes, the good thing about vector auto, imagine that I'm going to estimate a time varying vector autoregression. That time varying vector autoregression doesn't need a lot of information because it's relatively parsimonious. I don't have that many parameters. That's why Chris Sims pushed so hard for these vector autoregressions. But if I'm going to go then to machine learning, I have a lot of data requirements. And the problem is even 10 or 15 years may not be enough. Okay, but what I'm trying to say here is that in real life, we face a trade-off between parsimony and flexibility. So you can have a model like a vector autoregression or a very simple ARIMA model that is very simple, very parsimonious, very few parameters, and can be estimated. So there's no value to, to parsimony. Eh? Parsimony is useless because we have these huge machines with yes. huge memories, so yes. we can fit uh, whatever you know highly non-linear yes uh, machine learning a fitting uh, model and we don't even have to understand what's going on we check whether it works or not and that's it but yeah, I but agree that you know as behavior changes this is going to you know deteriorate over time well, this is the main thing problem we had with the VAR 
Initially, yeah, yeah, no, no, but, but, but the, but the problem over there is going to be to determine all the, all the coefficients or the parameters in the machine learning. All and these ways. Yeah, if you take the analogy with chess, when you were playing chess uh, before computers, you were learning theory. And yes. theory was telling you this is a good position or this is a bad position. Yes. Theory was actually wrong and highly approximative. Then yeah. came the computers, they were constantly violating the theory. They were playing crazy moves. Yes. Right? And you didn't need the theory any longer because the computer could compute uh, exactly the outcome of each move. So you throw away the theory, right? Yes. Yes. No, and in theory, fact, of course, is very parsimonious, but it has become useless. Yes. But let me, so first of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, in fact, over here, I mentioned that um, we have actually changed the way we play Go now because of what uh, AlphaGo has been able to do. But the, the, the advantage of chess and Go is that the environment is constant. The rules to right. play are, while the real economy is changing over time. So you need to determine all yeah. these ways over here. So, so then the big question is, do the parsimonious guy, are the parsimonious guys better when the environment changes? Yes, and that's what I'm... It's not clear that there is a trade-off. It, it's not clear that, well, of course, when the environment changes, your machine learning algorithm is going to be poorly, but so will your VAR. So will your structural DSG model or your yes. you know, parsimonious old uh, Don Bush style model. All those models are going to, be, to fail, right? And, uh, yes, but the, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that the amount of new information you get for the simple model to learn an approximation to the wall is lower than the amount of information you will need for the machine learning. But we don't care. The price of information is zero. That's the question. I mean, wh why do I care about how much information I need? Inform I have access to infinite information at zero price. So, you know, it, and, and, and that's, and that's what I... Informationally efficient is just uh, being wrong on the actual cost of information. Yeah, no, but that's, that's what I'm objecting because you are thinking about the cost of information as the cost of storing it. And that's not the cost yeah. of information I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the, the problem for GDP is not that I need memory to store GDP. The problem is I don't have information about GDP for more than a few years. Is that I don't have a lot of statistical agencies provide me with very, very little data. Okay. Now you could say, given that now we have machine learning and all these very powerful techniques, is there is an argument for providing statistical agencies with a larger budget so they can produce that data. So the problem over here is not storing the data. That I give you the point, the cost is zero. The problem over here is actually getting the data and that that data means something. So let me go back to the COVID example right now. The problem is not if you give me, since I was last, last couple of weeks, I have been estimating an econometric model of COVID. The problem of course was never for me to get the data on cases and deaths and storing it in my computer, that was trivial. The cost was always, I get some data from Spain or I get some data from New York City. Is this data reliable? Is this data good? Who has put that data together? Have they used a consistent way to think about this data? Is this data comparable across countries, etc.? And that's what I'm trying to say. If your model depends a lot on having a very, very rich set of information, having a model that has a lot of moving parts may fail along many, many dimensions. While if you have a model that is a little bit simpler, it may work a little bit better. And again, I'm not claiming this will always be the case. I'm not claiming you should always think about the simpler model as better. I'm just saying that in real life, they are, they are non-trivial trade-offs and that we should be aware of those. After all, I just started this discussion saying I love machine learning. It's not that I'm against machine learning. It's just I'm trying to be, precisely because I love machine learning, and try to be a little bit nuanced about what I can promise I can deliver to you. Can I, yes. Can I, make, can I ask a question please? On this uh, question of, uh, you know, uh, sparsity of explanation basically and uh, structural. If you look at very big data, and it's a long question in microeconometrics, for instance, you have basically two traditions. 
One is very structural, and it goes to the paper by niveau, etc., etc., and trying to find very fundamental, a few set of very fundamental uh, uh, structures and very fundamental parameters. And these parameters are constant over time, whatever the crisis. And you have another theory, which is basically closer to machine learning, a bit more structural, but which is basically trying to, to look at what happens. Mm -hmm. And I tend to believe that if you follow the second uh, trends with a lot of data, you get completely lost at some point. Yes. And if you have very, uh, let's take a simple example of what, can you, what you can do with or not with machine learning when you have a structural shock. You could, you could look at oil prices. If you look at oil prices, you will see that an increase in oil prices will probably cause a decrease in GDP. Mm -hmm. It's a long paper, I mean, by a long time ago on, a, on a stagflation, for instance. So you would say in the current crisis, we are evidencing a very strong decrease in oil prices, and we can observe that now. And yeah. this would, according to this machine learning stuff, it would mean okay, there will be a huge increase in GDP in the next few months. And we know it's wrong. Why? Because we all know that with simple reasoning of supply and demand, that the, there was an exogenous shock mm -hmm. on supply, basically. It causes a, fo a fall, and this causes a, a decrease in, in, in demand for oil. But if we have this very simple uh, reasoning in mind, and we know what structural parameters are, we know that, if we just look at figures, we are just lost in figures, and we can say just bullshit. So maybe I'm wrong, but what is your opinion? Uh, I think that with enough data, with enough data, the machine learning algorithm would have no problem uh, telling us whether it's a supply shock or a demand shock. It would say no. Uh, this time GDP is going to fall. That's yes. that's not a big deal. The big deal is we don't have enough macro data. Okay. Yes, exactly. But 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 I think so. That that's we, why that's why we need theory. Uh, but when we have data, the question. Yes, but the, and that's and that's exactly a little bit what I'm trying to say. So I'm trying to say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that look, machine learning can do a lot of things for you, but it cannot do everything. And there's so and that's why uh, I think that that the future for for us as a profession is trying to say look. Uh, so Joan Robinson had that great line that economics is a toolbox and that you know you have a hammer and you have a screwdriver and what happens now is we have a hammer we have a screwdriver and now we have a third tool and what i'm proposing is let's use this third tool when it makes sense and let's also try to think about how we complement the, the hammer and the screwdriver but a let's not over promise and b be aware that it has some limitations so in that sense, you know, um, the, the, the oil example is great because it, it, it very clearly talks about the supply and demand. And I actually have a similar example. If you read the paper, I, there is a lot of things I could not, could not. And this, by the way, this presentation is based on a paper that I just wrote a couple of months ago. Uh, if you read the paper on which this presentation is based, you will see that I have a very similar example about airlines. And that you will say, hey, the plane tickets on Monday morning are always the most expensive of the week, and it's when the planes are the fullest. Hence, <laughs> increasing your price level, the price of your tickets increases how full how full your planes are. Uh, so let's increase the, the prices of the, of the planes, and that obviously is nonsensical, and that's precisely the very basic demand supply um, argument. And then I try to go in the paper in some detail, precisely about those type of issues to which extent. And machine learning will be able to tease out supply and demand shocks. And yes, there are situations where it will be able to do it, sometimes where it will not be able to do it. And that will depend on the ability of data. So in that sense, I, 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 I fully agree with your points. Also, there is the issue that machine learning sometimes is a little bit of a black box, and it's kind of hard to tell what is going on. Uh, there is also the counter argument that the structural models, and I'm someone who has been estimating the structural models for 20 years, sometimes can also be a little bit black boxy. So those things cut in, 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 in both directions, and I think it's important to, to keep these things in perspective.